to be successful in the artist alley here, I think you need to be part of the program. Mm -hmm. Because even if people haven't come to your table yet, if you are a speaker at the, the graphic arts stage, yeah, you're going to you. get 30, 40, 50 people there to hear you talk about uh, graphic novels for young adults or yeah. graphic novels for preteens. Uh, you know, and, and then they get invited back to your table later in the convention. This is Joseph Coco. I'm at ALA 2018, the annual conference here in New Orleans. I'm here on behalf of Becca Hilburn's Art Process YouTube channel and blog. If you can introduce yourself, Richard. My name is Richard Green, and I'm a collector, an illustrator, and graphic designer. Okay. I'm married to a librarian, and that's what brings me to the American Library Association conferences. Fantastic. And you've been doing this for a long time, collecting. A long time. A uh, long what, time. what got you into it to start? I started out uh, as, a, as a young kid. I had a Sunday school teacher who was a comic collector. Okay. And we're still lifelong friends. Uh, he's in his 80s now. But uh, starting uh, when I graduated high school and got out into the working world, I. Uh, Together with him and, and four other people, we began to produce comic book conventions in the mid-70s in the uh, Philadelphia area. They were the first ones in the Philadelphia area. Okay. And uh, I started collecting cartoon and comic artwork, as well as the comic books themselves. All right. And how different were comic conventions back then? Obviously, Beck and I haven't been doing them for nearly as long as you have. Um, firstly, what, what made you... Uh, decide that it was best for you to start your own, and secondly, uh, how would you say have comic book conventions changed uh, oh. in, in the past 30 years or so? Well, I hope we have enough uh, digits to listen to this whole thing, but uh, <laughs> at the time, the only major uh, convention on the East Coast was Phil Swilling's uh, comic art convention in New York City, okay. and it was the 4th of July weekend every year, and it was legendary. And he had only been doing them for a few years when I started going to them. Yeah. And there were none in the Philadelphia area, and so a bunch of us that would trek to New York to spend a weekend with a bunch of great comic artists and writers uh, decided, why don't we do one in the Philadelphia area, bring one down to South Jersey. Yeah. And so uh, we did one about 15 minutes outside of Center City, Philadelphia, uh, starting in 75. And we were doing conventions in shopping malls. We got media attention, and the manager of the Cherry Hill Mall in New Jersey, who, which was the first shopping mall in America, um, she saw it in the news. And so she approached us and said, how would you like to do a comic convention in our malls? Wow. And that kind of worked out neat. Yeah. So that was kind of a, we did that for a couple years. We did it for about three years doing conventions. And then we kind of lost interest in it, and a lot of his uh, lives took different directions. Yeah. And um, but at that time, there were no conventions with ex wrestlers and and faded TV stars and such. Right. And it was all about the comics themselves and the art and the stories. Yeah. And they were pretty much like like big parties. We would rent a hotel for a weekend, sell dealers' tables to pay for the room nights that that covered the artists so we could invite them and pay for a room overnight. Yeah. And it was a party. And we put fans and artists and writers together. And were, were these big name people that the public would know? Or was well, it independent people? Or yeah, both? yeah, people like Roy Thomas and Frank Bourne and Gene Colan, a lot of legendary people. Uh, Jim Steranko, people that are legends today, uh, were very approachable and accessible. And Charles Vest, Mike Peluda, I could just go on and on naming people that came to these conventions as guests okay. and became friends. Yeah. So in a lot of cases, we were putting these artists together who had admired each other's work, but never met. And so it was a meeting place for them too, okay. to socialize and get together. Yeah, and that definitely uh, is pretty similar to how some of the like SPS and SPX and Mocha Fest and those sort of conventions are now. But some of those conventions are becoming a little less about uh, comic book artists. So, um, uh, I mean, certainly NYCC and SDCC and those sort of things have long moved on from that. But Well, the, the, the industry was much different then. You had your big mainstream companies mm -hmm. like Marvel yeah. and DC and Charlton to a lesser yeah. extent. It was a, always considered the, the, the ugly stepchild of the comic book industry, but had great stuff. And yeah. people like Joe Staten and, and Nick, Nick Cuddy were, were uh, working there and doing wonderful, wonderful stuff. Um, yeah. 
so you had the mainstream market and you had the underground comics that had come out of San Francisco and Chicago and New York in the in the late 60s and early 70s. People like Jay Lynch and uh, um, uh, Ron Turner's Last Gasp, those people, they were the they were the alternate comics of their day. Yeah. And and some of it was uh, autobiographical self stories by the writers. A lot of it was, and, but it was also drugs and sex and rock and roll. And they were they were the 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 bad the black sheep of the family of the comic world. Yeah. But we were putting them together because we loved all the artwork and the writers from both worlds. Now you've got you still have your underground comics, but but it's become more considered alternative press. So places like Small Press Expo, Comic Arts Brooklyn, S uh, um, Mocha Fest are where all these uh, young artists and uh, people just coming into the industry are using the comics medium as a form of self-expression. Right. And we love, my wife Kathy and I, who is a librarian, uh, we love going to these because we meet all this fresh young talent. From the yeah. So you you got into collecting. Uh, what would you say a collector is looking for at those sort of comic book conventions? Uh, do you do you just want to browse around and see everything, or are there particular uh, artists like maybe fresh faces, like you said, you haven't seen before? Or are you also coming to see the people that you know? Like what, it, it's all what, of what those is things. the draw from a it, it's all of those things. It's okay. all of those things. Uh, you know, we, we it's like old home week. You come and you see people that you've known for years. Mm -hmm. uh, you may already have art by them. Perhaps it's a chance to get a piece of art by them, or talk sit down and talk to a writer that you've admired and there are stories that you like. Yeah. Um, and that's a great thing. But um, it's also we love the serendipity of coming to one of these conventions and seeing somebody for the first time. Somebody who maybe this is their first convention as an exhibitor on yeah. display, and 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 it's a it's a journey of, of personal discovery to 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 find somebody. So finding yeah. Becca, for example, at this convention has been a real delight. You know, and I think I hope it's Glad to hear a that. long term. No, no, I hope it becomes a long term relationship because because now that Kathy and I are, are the old guard, we can make introductions and network and connect. And it is all about networking. Sure, it really is. Okay. And uh, how would you say, having been to a lot of these independent comic conventions and come to ALA, you guys have been to, a, yeah, you've been to several ALA's. Many, many ALA's, PLA, ALA Midwinter, yeah. BEA, Book Expo America. Okay. Yeah, how we go to how would you say the artist alley here is different than just a conventional independent comic convention? Oh, much, much smaller. <laughs> yeah. Too small. Yeah. In, in our, in our, um, our uh, experience has been that, that while you get great people here and great talent, there's there aren't as many people here as should be. Yeah. Um, Do you think librarians would come to the Artist Alley more if it was a, a bigger section of the I think exhibition? so. I think so, yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting. Uh, to be successful in the Artist Alley here, I think you need to be part of the program. Mm -hmm. Because even if people haven't come to your table yet, if you are a speaker at the, the Graphic Arts stage, yeah, we'll you're going to you. get 30, 40, 50 people there to hear you talk about uh, graphic novels for young adults or yeah. graphic novels for pre-teens, uh, you know, and, and then they get invited back to your table later in the convention mm -hmm. and they'll say, oh, that was interesting, I want to go check them out. Yeah, and, and they've and, got friends who are here as well, so hopefully they'll bring some other people by. Exactly right. Or, yeah. or somebody they know needs to know about it at their own library. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's an important thing is, is yeah. getting involved in one of the programs somewhere, either an outside conference room or the stage here in the convention. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, and you said the, the size is different. Uh, how do you feel about how people are uh, approaching uh, librarians? Like, are, are you being greeted the same way at these conventions? Are people pitching to you the same way at these conventions? Uh, are you able to spend one-on-one -on -one time with them the same as independent comic conventions? Uh, oh, you get to spend more time and more quality time here okay. at this convention. Uh, the, the mainstream conventions like Big Apple Con or the New York Comic Con, or God forbid San Diego, uh, you know, it's so frenetic and so mobbed, and everybody's got to be somewhere else all the time. Yeah, um, it's hard to find quality time. I'm sure it can happen, but, but the odds are against you. 
Yeah. Whereas here, you, you pretty you much know, have to meet up after the convention to do that. You can stand at somebody's table and talk to them for five or ten minutes. You can go to dinner with them or lunch. You can grab a bite to eat here on the convention floor or whatever, and spend a little time. Okay. And discover them and network with them. Okay. So that that that's an important aspect of these of the library and book shows. The other interesting thing is the generation of the young generation of librarians that are coming up grew up on graphic novels and comics, so they have a much greater appreciation. Yeah. At one time, and there's quite a few young people at the show. It's not a lot. Yeah. You know, we're talking about librarians under 35. Mm -hmm. You know, and the, there's a whole generation of them now that come to these conventions. And at one time, my mother was a library director, and she always encouraged us to read comic books. Anything that gets kids reading yeah. is is beloved by librarians. They yeah. just they and want that kids has to been be reading. A common message at ALA, as far as I can tell. So it's not just a small <coughs> group of people who are looking for comics. It seems to be pervasive. It's universal that, among yeah. librarians that anything that gets kids reading is good, and and especially young readers, early readers. You know, words and pictures together, children's books are words and pictures together, well, so are comics and so are graphic novels. Yeah. It, it enables the kid to identify, like, oh, car, that's a picture of a car, oh, that must be the word for a car. And they learn to read that way, there's a certain amount. Yeah. So, so it's, it's fascinating in here, and at the alternative comics conventions, you see more books and magazines aimed at very young readers. Right. <coughs> you go to the mainstream comic violence conventions and, and like it's that. violence and sex and, and you know superhero stuff and yes they're telling stories about diversity and acceptance and and you know uh, justice will out and that sort of stuff mm -hmm. but they're not there aren't as many there are a few aimed at young people <coughs> excuse me okay and you'd mentioned ALS, ALA Midwinter. Uh, that's something Becca and I haven't done. We've been told that there isn't really an artist alley in the Midwinter. Uh, is that your experience? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, um, one of the aspects of all these book conventions is that there's not only an artist alley usually, mm -hmm. but there's a section, a zine section, yeah, the for zine people that are really. self-publishing magazines. Yep. And all the independent publisher um, exhibitors that have a booth in the hall uh, quite often have artists. Right. So at midwinter, you're more apt to have IDW or Lion Forge or, or Manga Classics. Yeah. Or, so there's or, definitely going to be yeah independent yeah, artists represented. They They'll just be might at those not booths. be creators unless they're just at those booths. Yeah. They're doing signings at those booths. Yeah. Some hang around for the whole show at those booths, and then quite often um, there is some sort of an uh, an artist alley at midwinter, okay. and I think that there will be more and more. Um, Sounds good. Well, I'm hoping so, that do you number. get the same sort of vibe at the midwinter show as you Very do at the annual? Very much It's just smaller. It's yeah. just smaller. Yeah. And it's only every other year. Okay. Midwinter. Yeah. The other convention that's an annual is PLA. Yeah. The Public Library Association. I would uh, love to hear about that. And we that's haven't another good one. Into it much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's another. I was just in Philadelphia. I don't know where it is next. I'm not even sure. But it's a it's is a traveling. Um, yeah convention just like ALA. ALA's in, in New Orleans uh, this week, but next year it'll be in Seattle. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So uh, we're looking forward. And and when it, that happens, you get a, a different crop of artists and writers mm -hmm. because the publishers, the exhibitors, and the artist alley will draw from local talent. Of course. Uh, yeah, that was one of the things that drew us um, this year. Is because Beck and I are both from New Orleans, so we thought you had the connection. We would have, yeah, we would have a, a better chance. Can also meet back up with friends and things. So, uh, right. yeah, I, I I feel like uh, you're probably going to get people who are uh, a decent amount of people who are tied to the area, depending on where the show is. And, and in the Northwest, you've got the Vancouver, Bellingham, Seattle, Portland area where there are there's yep. a lot of great talent. Yeah. So I think it's going to be a great show for for people that are interested in. In, in graphic arts, uh, uh, narrative illustration, I like to call it. Okay. That's, a, that's a different way to think of it, is narrative illustration. Okay. And can you tell us a little bit about uh, your comics collection? How much of the pieces, huh. um, or, or comics art collection, yeah. how much of the pieces do you have hanging up? How much of the pieces do you have in storage? Or Kathy uh, and I are, are fortunate. We have a large Victorian house in, in New Jersey, South Jersey, where we're from. And um, having started in before I met her in the, in the early 70s, I started collecting uh, not just 
comic book art, but newspaper strip art, political cartoons, gag panels. As uh, I co-produced the conventions and met a lot of artists, I would get pieces of art from them. Uh, buying, trading, collecting with other collectors, um, selling for them, representing some of the artists sometimes, selling their paintings. But my, my taste in, in illustration art, American illustration, expanded beyond narrative illustration or panel art, as some people call comics, but, yeah. into book illustration. So the cover paintings for paperback books and pulp magazines, the classic pulps of the 30s. Um, a lot of artists like Boris Vallejo and Tim Hildebrand and Larry Schwinger and, and some others uh, became good friends of mine and I sold paintings for them. And I always took my commission in art because they could afford to be more generous with art than they could with the money. They right. needed the money. Yeah. So, you know, you, you sell a painting for X thousand dollars and you can have 10% of the money or a painting. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you know. <laughs> you don't have you're to be tied in. into that community, so it's probably not that difficult for you to help them move a piece. So exactly. You're building your exactly. collection and you're building, building more collection. connections so, with people so, at the same so time. Now, uh, and the other thing that, it, well, so now Kathy and I find ourselves with a collection of well over a thousand pieces of artwork. Okay. And there's probably that's amazing. There's probably sixty to seventy pieces hanging. Because you're you're talking about original artwork, to original, be clear. Art, no not prints, prints. not yeah. prints. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we like I like the 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 uniqueness of having an original, one of a kind, as opposed to a print. Yeah. You know, sure, there's a portfolio of prints somewhere in the house, but yeah. where we stash stuff that just kind of falls into your lap. But mm -hmm. but for the most part, uh, you know, we enjoy living with it and displaying it. For example. When my wife and I got engaged, she got a diamond ring, and I got a Joe Schuster Superman strip, you know, from her, uh, from 1941, an original pen and ink wow. by Joe Schuster, signed yeah. by him, with a photo with him in the picture, you know, mm -hmm. and that was, that's a pretty neat piece. So we enjoy living with that on the walls. Yeah. I mean, the way I look at it, you can buy a stock certificate that may or may not go up and fluctuate in value and put it in a safe deposit box somewhere and never see it. Whereas yeah. you can have that piece of artwork on your wall and enjoy it, it every enriches day. Your, yeah, enriches your life. Day, yeah, and day. you've also helped artists build, help build culture. In, in you know, many ways. As opposed to stocks, which is just personal gain for the most part. Right, right, <laughs> right. And, and can go up and down and fluctuate. But yeah. I'll tell you, the, the, the uh, illustration art has pretty consistently gone up in value. You know, you're it's not seeing hear. Frazetta originals drop in price. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so yeah, yeah, there, there's that. But at the same time, also, starting in 78, I wish I'd started it in 75, but in 78, I started taking a blank sketchbook, mm -hmm. you know, a hardback book of blank paper to the conventions that I was co-producing yeah. and getting the friends and artists that were coming to those conventions to draw right in those books. And I'm now up to book number seven. So the first six, there's about 100 artists in each book. Yeah. Uh, so each page, a different... Spanning I, I, a long period of time. Lots of different people, different places. Right, right. Like 40 years, 40 years yeah. worth. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, there was a long period of time where they languished and I wasn't doing, uh, you know, I was working and raising a family, so I wasn't uh, going to conventions much, so there was a big gap for a while. But uh, I try, now I try and get at least a book a year filled with, with artists. And it's new people I've met, people I've admired for years, people I've known for years. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a variety and it's a very unique way to look at a period of history of cartoon and comic kind of art. Yeah. And there, more and more people are doing that now. I see a lot of sketches. Yeah, I see young people. I see It's become a real people, trendy thing. Yeah. But in 1978, there weren't many people doing it. There were a few. Mm -hmm. There was a few of us. And to see one of those, those uh, what we call dinosaurs, you know, that, that's been lying fallow for years, mm -hmm. all of a sudden come to the surface and, and see that and go through it. And, like the first book, I, the one I started in the has five EC comic artists, you know, which is yeah. which is remarkable because yeah, a lot we of those people are born last there. night. Yeah. You know, you know. So, so, so you do see that. But for my sketchbooks, because I have a world, a, a foot in the comic book world and the alternative comic world and undergrounds, and then also in the book world mm -hmm. where there's children's book illustrators yeah. and fine artists. You see, these books are, are much more diverse than somebody who only goes to comic book conventions, mainstream comic book conventions. Great collection of superheroes and villains, 
but you don't see children's book illustrators in there, and you don't see political cartoons. So Rob Rogers, who was just fired by the Pittsburgh Post Gazette for not drawing Trump positive cartoons, he just got fired because you know he was being true to his his beliefs in yeah. what he was cartooning. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got him in three different sketchbooks, and you know because I've known him for years. Okay. So so you know you're, you're finding people that have I believe uh, culturally historic significance in these books as well. I mean, it, it's amazing that when I start to look through the early books and I see, uh, I must have oh, 200 or more Eisner Award winners and Nebula winners and, and you know, people that have won the Eight People who are, who are getting award. accolades after you've known them for a long well, period of time. Exactly, or, or won the, those awards over the years. Uh, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to meet a lot of these people before they were award winners. But I recognize their talent, and I wanted to get them in the, in the book. Yeah, it's fantastic. So, uh, what I was trying to get at earlier with your collections is, it sounds like uh, you try to have a personal connection to the art. Um, I prefer that. A, a little more than just meeting them. So, um, would you like? How would you feel if someone actually contacted you and said, "I've got some art pieces. Uh, would you be interested in them?" Would, I was interested in looking and listening. I mean, there's okay. no harm in that. Yeah. Fair um, enough. If I can afford it, maybe I would. If it's something I like and I can afford it. Right. Then, I was then just I, curious. I, I haven't met too many um, comic art collectors or art collectors in general, so I, I wasn't sure how you felt about that, if if the personal connection was required or if you just um, It's not required. Uh, it's nice. It's always a, a, an added yeah, bonus. So you have some type if of I can get a picture it. of myself and the artist together, you yeah. know, with a piece of artwork, that's great. And it's yeah. documentation of, of, of provenance of, of collecting the piece. Certainly. But it's not necessary. It's not essential. Okay. And uh, you are an artist yourself. Um, I am a graphic designer and illustrator. I work for um, a great guy, Leslie Cabarga, uh, as an airbrush illustrator, studio assistant, working for him. Um, I work for toy companies. Uh, now, my career uh, for the last 10 years or so has been primarily as a designer of books and magazines. Okay. For different publishers. Right. And um, how much are you creating for fun versus uh, doing it for fun? I do very little for fun. Okay. <laughs> I don't, I, I, to me, it's, it's my admiration for people that can draw and I can watch those images flow out of those pens effortlessly. Is, it, it knows no bounds. My admiration for them knows no bounds because it is just remarkable to me. For me to draw something and create something that I'm satisfied with or willing to let somebody else look at is is hard. It's difficult. It's really tough. So I don't draw for fun. I can doodle. I can sketch. Um, functioning as an art director or a creative director, I can draw enough to get my concept and idea across to somebody that I'm paying to do the real hard work. Yeah. That, that's where it's at. Okay. And um, I know we discussed last night uh, how you got into the airbrushing, but um, uh, what, what made you to what made you continue to explore using airbrushing? As well, I was I was lucky, I, you know. I, I um, it, it just doesn't seem like it's that common of a. Um, I got involved in a blue collar trade, uh, airbrush, uh, uh, auto body uh, repair and painting. Mm -hmm. And and part of that is started to use touch up guns and small spray paint equipment to do motorcycle tanks and the sides of vans and do illustration. And you gotta realize that during that whole time I was also as a as an avocation, you know, vocation was painting the cars, but the avocation was running comic book conventions and collecting and running around with other people, wheeling and dealing in comic books and comic art. Yeah. So so it was only a natural extension to begin to use the, the artist's airbrush. As a, as a medium, uh, right. instead, you know, of a tool just instead of a, car. A, yeah. a car airbrush. So uh, Kabarga, who is one of the leading airbrush illustrators, um, you know, in the 70s and 80s and 90s, uh, doing covers for Time and Newsweek and Fortune magazine, album covers, yeah, big um, stuff. Yeah, the, all the Betty Boop uh, greeting cards for paper news graphics. Um, Meeting him and having him as a friend before I graduated art school was just a, kind of a natural segue into that. Okay. 
Well, congratulations. And finally, would you have any advice? Oh, uh, where can we find your work online if somebody wanted to hire you to do something? Do you take free events? I don't have a website, which okay. is kind of weird, but um, no, you know not really. I mean? I'm not. I'm not yeah. chasing one. I'm not looking for people gotcha. to find me. I, I'm at a point now where I would much rather generate the project by putting together a publisher and an artist yeah. and say, let me design you, the book. You know how to orchestrate things. Joe DeVito, um, the cover artist, I mean, he's done all the Doc Savage book covers for over 20 years. Uh, he's done hundreds and hundreds of book covers. Um, is a friend. And uh, he owns the intellectual property in town of Skull Island. And uh, he wanted to do a book to uh, lock down his intellectual property in book form. Okay. Um, and he asked me to design the book. And I was very proud to do it. It's, it's gorgeous. Uh, we only printed 500 copies. It's a 268 page hardback with a slip case and, and parchment paper and wow, boss so paper. Wow, it went all out for the people it, who are dedicated it's fans. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And there's less than 100 copies left now. And, um, it, it, it's also available as a book online digital book and there'll be an on demand uh, paperback version in two volumes. But but again, you know, getting involved with him to design the book was it was a thrill. I mean, because I'm a King Kong fan and, and who isn't and, and, and I'm a Joe DeVito fan. Uh, Joe's also done a lot of book covers for uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs Incorporated, E R B Incorporated. Okay. Which is the estate of Edgar Rice Burroughs. So being involved in, in Kong and, Bur and Tarzan and John Carter and Mars and, and all of that sort of stuff is it just it feeds my love of that kind of genre, you know, fantasy, and adventure, and stuff like that. Okay. But I'm also working with, uh, with David Spurlock of Vanguard Publishing. Yeah, yeah, uh, I know. Yeah, it does all those great art books of Frazetta and everything. We're now working on a book um, of uh, the paintings of Daniel Horn who is a uh, historic illustrator and a painter of horror subjects. Uh, one of his paintings was in the movie Crimson Peak, and we're, uh, I put Spurlock and Horn together to do a book project together. I took them both to dinner and said, let's do a book, because nobody had done a book on Daniel. And that's, that's the fun. That's, that's where I'm at now in my career, is putting people together and saying, hey, let's do this. Okay. And finally, would you have any advice to an artist who's considering tabling at ALA AC for the first time? Huh. My advice, uh, you know, it's great to jump into the deep end of the pool. Um, that's great. Yeah. But if there's any way you can attend one first, yeah, wouldn't be a bad idea. Yeah, definitely okay. if you have some association with the library, try to get in on that. Okay. Here's a good way to look at it. If you can go to your state library association conference, Every state does. Sometimes two or three states will run one together. But for example, the New Jersey Library Association. The Texas Library Association is the largest association conference in the country for librarians. Okay. The Texas Library Association, it's usually in Austin or Dallas or Houston, uh, because those are the places big enough to handle it. Yeah. Go to one of those statements first and see, and then realize that that ALA or PLA or ALA Midwinter are a hundred times bigger than that. Yeah. Okay. So it's great to somehow get a table in Artist Alley at ALA, but you're jumping into the deep end. You know, right. if, you've, if you've done the New York Comic Con or Big Apple Con you'll, you'll, or, or no. Emerald City or one of the big conventions, okay, it's, it's more genteel and calm than that. Okay, but it's about that size. You know, it's going to be that big. Um, the other thing is try and get involved in the program. Yeah. You know, find out who's moderating the panels, uh, who, what panels are they looking to put together, and can you fit into one of those? Okay, if you're so a young instead of trying artist, to pitch your own thing, you say, hey, I'm familiar enough with this topic. I see you have three speakers. Could I join that? Exactly. Yeah. You know, if you're a young woman, cartoonist, illustrator, who's doing books, not unlike Becca, <laughs> uh, you know, who uh, has already published, self-published perhaps, a half a dozen pieces, or done some mainstream commercial work, uh, approach them and say, hey, I can talk about women's issues in young adult graphic novels. Yeah. I'd like to be on that panel. I have the the bona fides, I have the pedigree to be on that panel. And that's the way to get it. That's a good way to get it.
Well, thank you, Richard. It's been great talking to you. It's great to see somebody collecting comic art and supporting people here. You said you shipped back, what, seven, seven boxes, boxes so of far. books and comics and not and just art. graphic novels and yeah, stuff. Yeah. But it's, it's fiction and a lot of it's gifts for other people. Yeah. Well, we definitely appreciate you coming by and supporting the, the comic art. Hey, arts. hey, it's fun. <laughs> the fun never stops. All right, well, thank you so much for letting me interview you. I think you gave some good insights of what people are looking for at the convention. My pleasure.